It's room number three, Mr. Reed. Thank you. I'm not quite sure how long. Three or four days, anyway. Perhaps longer. Oh, that'd be all right, sir. I'll try and let you know in good time. That will be appreciated. Now, the dining room's at the bottom of the stairs to your left. Mm -hmm. uh, bar's just through there, to mm -hmm. the right. Now, I'm afraid there's no porter on in the evening. Oh, but... this is all I have. I can manage. Oh, I'll show you up, then. Oh, I'll find it. Up the stairs here. If you're sure, uh, turn left at the top, second door, number three. Ah, oh, thank you. Fine. Oh, your key. Oh, yes, would help, wouldn't it? After you. Thanks very much. Who's that then? New single. Just checked in. Has he though? Mm. Just for a night? A few days. Not sure. Mr. Michael Reed from London. Hmm. Lovely name. Jenny. Lovely manners. Wonder what he's doing in Ashlingham. I didn't ask. You got a bill for me? No walking sticks. Two stairs at a time, even. That's promise and change around here. The bill? Oh, oh uh, number six. Mm. Pop the coffee down for us, Lawn, will you? I ain't had time. Not to drink like last year. Where are they? Farmers. <laughs> My heart bleeds for them. Oh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Gin and tonic, please. More important, where am I? For God's sake, give me another drink, Ted. Uh, yeah. With you in a minute. Oh, Mr. Reed. There you are. Sorry to disturb you, but there's a telephone call. For me? Mm. Did they give a name? No, sir. I've switched it through to the box just outside the door. You can take it there if you wish. Oh, right. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> right, sir. Oh, who's that? Reed. Oh, you remember. He telephoned this morning. Mr. Reed? Speaking. Oh, good evening. Sorry to drag you to the phone. Uh, my name is Farr. Good evening. Farr? Of course, yes. Yes, of course, Mr. Farr. Mr. Goodwin rang you, then? Uh, this morning. I met him just before Miss Bates' untimely death. Yeah. He said you would be arriving this evening. Well, it's good of you to ring so soon. Well, I just wanted you to know I should be only too pleased to do whatever I can to help. Uh, that's very good of you. Not only pleased, but eager. Uh, I understand you don't want to reveal your interest, uh, but I am at your disposal when and if you require me. Well, Mr. Goodwin also probably told you that I'm not committed as yet. I'm just here to assess my own reactions before making up my mind. Uh, he said as much. I hoped I might help to convince you. Well, perhaps we could meet. Oh, whenever you like. Tomorrow any good? I'm relatively free in the morning, uh, but I can pull off anything I have for... No, 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 the morning would be fine. How about ten o'clock? Oh, perfect. You'll find my office just up the hill from the crowd. Right opposite the church. Uh, on Wednesdays, the manager take over the bar, which is why he weren't around when you arrived. Yeah, I suppose staff's always a problem in a small place like this. Keeping them is. Not much oh. for them in Ashling, you see. No, I suppose not. <laughs> Your first visit? Yes. Mm, then I hope you'll make it a memorable one. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know East Suffolk at all. Ah, that's good country. But mm. quiet. Fine if you like the quiet life. Yeah. Summer would be your busiest time, I suppose. Although you're, what, five miles off the coast road? About that. But mm. With the castle and the boys' college, the weekenders, we're usually pretty full. Ah, yeah. Locals use the hotel bar here quite a bit, too. Oh, uh, good night. Sir, madam. Yes, that's peaceful enough little place. Appeals to the traditionalists. <laughs> Bags of beams and wattle and daub. <laughs> and all genuine, too. Not what you'd call lively. No. Although, uh, I seem to remember... D didn't you have a spot of excitement of some sort up here a year or so ago? Ah, you mean the murder? Murder? Do I? A young girl up at the back of the castle, not far from here. And when was that? Oh, back in 67. Mm. Not so peaceful then for a week or two, I can tell you. Oh, I can imagine. She'd been strangled. And not only that, <laughs> raped as well, they said. Mm. That sort of excitement you can do without. Local girl? Not born local. Living here with her grandmother. A girl named Diana King. Fifteen, that's all. <sighs> so was he. Martin Lundy. The one what done it. Mm. Staying at a camp just outside the town. When you can, Ted. Uh, Copin's actually buying. Oh, oh so coming. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Yes, of course. That's, uh, Mr. Danville. That was him what found her body. Oh. Same again? Yeah, unless Calvin wants to buy doubles. Oh, what do you mind? I was, uh, I was just talking to this gentleman about our time of notoriety. Oh, were you? Hmm. This is Mr. Reed's first visit to Ashlingham. Mean, you remember the case? Oh, not many do. Uh, care to join us? Oh, that's very kind of you. My name's, uh, Calvin. This is Bill Danville, local postmaster general. How do you do? Visiting Mr. Reed? Yes, a few days, taking a look round. 
I was wondering about a cottage in this area. Well, you could do worse. It depends. Uh, not much trade up here, no industry, and with all the stations closed, commuting's hopeless. Mm, a bit far for that, anyway. Pretty unspoiled still, though how long that'll last, well, remains to be seen, mm. I suppose. And yeah. uh, we're not given to murders and the like, not as a rule, anyway. Yeah, two whiskeys, a gin, and the rest of your tonic. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, what about yours? Well, I still got Mr. Reed's. Oh, I see. Ah. <clears throat> Yes, it must have been pretty unpleasant at the time. It was. Yeah, she was a nice-looking kid. Oh, you knew her then? Well, not really. Oh? Well, not to say no. I'd seen her around, but uh, not like some of you did. Who said I knew her? Well, surely you did. She worked for Mr Danville in the Christmas holidays. She was still at the technical school in Ipswich. Yes, uh, well, um, cheers. Here's hoping you'll find what you're looking for, Mr Reed. Hmm? Oh, the cottage. Yes, yeah. Cheers. Uh, cheers. 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 Mm. I was telling Mr. Reed that it was you what found the body. That's right. Mm, must have been a nasty experience. Down in Moat Bush. That's a sort of a copse. A hollow just outside the old castle moat. Mm -hmm. Surrounded by trees and bushes. There was a big Why, search. Uh, she... don't we leave it alone, Ted? Well, I was only I don't trying to want put him to in the... talk about it. His history. They got the filthy young devil who did it, and that's all that matters. Yeah, I'm afraid I brought it up. It's all right, Mr. Reed. Sort of thing you prefer to forget, though, isn't it? Mm? Yes, I'm sure it is. Anyway, um... I've got to go. Oh, early night? i still got some work to do. Yeah. Hang on, I'm coming your way. Uh, Edna said to remind your wife, Lane, that's flower club or something tomorrow. Yeah, I'll tell her. See you around then, I expect, Mr. Reed. I hope so, yes. Cheers. Uh, Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night, and thank you for the drink. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. <sighs> well, uh, will you join me in another? Well, I won't, if you don't mind, sir. Uh, gin and tonic? Yes, please. Sorry if I let you in for that just now. Oh, they ain't usually so touchy. Well, it's understandable. You say they both knew her. Well, Len must have forgot. She was around a lot. Shall I put it on your bill? Yes, you may as well. Mm. And, of course, they were both here when it happened. Bill Danville took part in the search, I told you. Mm. She'd been missing nearly two days. He found these, uh, well, you know, part of a girl's clothing, and then her lying some distance away under them two branches. Branches? Being twisted from a tree close by. She was, um, well, just this red shirt thing over her face. And the branches had been put over to cover her like a, like a big X. You know, careful. Purposely like that. Hmm. I think I want to forget that, too. I helped in the search. But in another area. Not Len Calpin. He had to go away with his wife. Oh, must have been the day before we found her. I wasn't here for the search, anyway. And that was four years ago. It's not that, though. We've had a woman writer living here. Suddenly started dragging it all up again a few months back for some book or other. Oh, is that so? <laughs> Got some stupid idea that Lundy never did it. Questioning, checking, stirring it all up again. Oh. Seemed to think it could have been somebody here. Upset a lot of people. Yes, I can see why it might. Boy, he was as guilty as hell. Still, that's all over now. Oh? Hmm. She took ill and died sudden. In London. About six weeks ago. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> A lot of people here weren't. Mm. Including Mr. Culpin and Mr. Danville, I imagine. Well, here we are. It seemed more sense than the office. We can talk at the actual scene of the crime. I couldn't agree more. Castle's still very impressive, Mr. Farr. Yeah, Norman, of course. Open to visitors most of the year. And that's Castle Acre, where the girl and Martin Lundy met that evening. Ah, but not by design. You can see the castle's virtually part of the town. It's a regular meeting place for local youngsters. This and the swimming pond mentioned quite a bit at the trial. And where's that? Well, across some fields about a mile from here. Would you say you've been over all the notes and references Miss Bates left? In several times. Then you'll know as much about the case as I do. Well, from the evidence, the depositions and opinions may be... But I've got to tell you, as yet, I see no reason to doubt the original verdict. I'm not surprised. But I maintain the prosecution evidence was circumstantial. Every statement relating Lundy to the girl was pure conjecture. Yet they met, they went off together, she failed to return home, and he was the last person to be seen with her. By anyone who spoke at the trial. And that's important, Mr. Reed. At the trial. Hmm. So, like Alison Bates, you believe somebody here knows more than they've told. Oh, for obvious reasons. 
<laughs> you know, Miss Bates referred to the book as a labor of conscience. But you handled the boy's defense. Which would make me prejudiced? Hmm, perhaps. Oh, I'm just a local country solicitor, Mr. Reed. But as an orphan, no money, no influence, he relied on me. I think with a better lawyer, he wouldn't be spending the most important years of his youth in detention. Unless he was guilty. Oh, I don't think I'm that prejudiced. He was 15. Not committable under the Homicide Act, but under Section 53 of the Children's and Young Persons Act. To be detained during Her Majesty's pleasure. For the last four years. Uh, that's why Alison Bates' book was so important. If through it we could have proved merely a reasonable doubt, I could have made application to the Home Office on his behalf. Well, she certainly seems to have convinced herself, but she offers no solution, no alternative to Lundy. Oh, she was still working hard on it when she died. Obviously. And now that she's dead, I gather Mr. Goodwin's asked you to consider carrying it through for her. Uh, consider it, yes. Jack Goodwin's not only my publisher, he's a good friend. I could hardly refuse him that. But I wasn't keen. I didn't live here as Alison did. I wasn't here when it happened. I have no feelings about it. In fact, I'd never even heard of the case until a few days ago. So you need to assess your own feelings before coming to a decision? That's it. Well, this is where it all started. Well, let's take a look, can we? Yes, of course. I merely suggested bringing the car because the locals know of my obsession. They might add two and two. I just an idea they might be less reluctant to talk if they didn't know my interest. And after the Crown Bar last night... Ah, so you told me. Alison's research didn't exactly endear her to the natives, did it? Seekers after truth in this sort of situation seldom endear themselves to those who could be wanting to hide it. Sometime I'd like to know a bit more about Danville and Culpin. Whatever I can. But what I'd like to do now is to give it to you as we go, as I've gathered the story, and then if you could correct me or add anything. That way I'll know I've got it right. Fine. So, Diana King has been to technical college as usual that day... She catches her usual train from Ipswich, gets home at about five o'clock, she has her tea, changes her clothes, and leaves her grandmother's house around 6.30. Right. Mm -hmm. And important, because the pathologist set the time of death on this occasion by observation of the stomach contents. Obviously the tea she ate. Yeah, maybe we could come back to that. Well, it ties up later. Uh, you'll see. Diana then meets her friend in the marketplace. Uh, Jenny, was it? That's right. You probably served your breakfast this morning. At the Crown? Yeah, been there ever since she left school, a waitress. Her hair. On the full side, a sort of wide-eyed surprise. Uh, she could be useful to you. She knew them both. Well, actually, she appeared for the prosecution at the trial. Some pretty damning evidence, too, that Lundy had previously tried to be familiar with her. How long had Lundy been around Ashlingham, then? Oh, about three weeks. The camp operates every summer for boys from orphan schools, or, or rather it did until this happened. <laughs> Not anymore. Pity. Anyway, Diana and Jenny start to walk up here. Lundy and another boy ride up behind them on bicycles. Uh, they stop and talk for a minute. The boys then ride on, and they all meet again on Castle Acre here. Tell me, did Diana know Lundy prior to that evening? Well, they'd met several times in the evenings. Uh, this is a small place. Yes, I wasn't sure. They play around in the meadow here for a bit. Uh, something to do with a dog? Yes, Frank Bruce's dog, throwing sticks for it. Oh, there were several other youngsters here. And Lundy talks to Diana, tells her that some foals have been born on a farm. Yes, Philip Nair's farm in Back Lane. It's a local walk. Uh, there's a turning into it past the marketplace. It circles behind the castle and leads back into the town this other way, uh, via the Chaddington Road. How would he know about the foals? Well, he was interested in farming and animals. Philip Nair encouraged him. Let him help out around the place. He would have seen them. Yes, I see. And Diana's interested and says she'd like to see them. She shouts to Jenny where she's going. Jenny teases her, telling her to be careful, and they leave. Jenny's warning, teasing or not, was made much of in court, particularly with her evidence. But they leave, with Lundy pushing his bicycle. Which of the two ways did they go? Oh, down the approach here. Uh, let's get back to the car. And through the town to the marketplace. It was about 7.10, they almost bumped into a woman passing who remembered the time. You say there were others here, besides Jenny and Lundy's friend? Oh, one or two. Uh, get in. We'll go the same way. Right. Good morning, Mr. Barr. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Ames. I have that book you requested, if you want to collect it. Oh, I'll try and get in. Is the library open this morning? Beth? Beth, come back here. Uh, yes, 11 till 1 today. 
I thought I'd give her a run first, keep her quiet. Good day for it anyway. Oh, lovely. Oh, dear. Beth? Beth? Come back here. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Farr. Goodbye, Mrs. Ames. Sorry about that. Mrs. Ames runs the branch library. Not one of those who supported Miss Bates. Were there any? Well, if there were, they didn't bother to mention it. But Mrs. Ames and her ladies were quite verbose on the subject. The type of a glad Lundy was an outsider, not one of us. A ready-made scapegoat for something unclean. You sound bitter. No, not bitter. A little ashamed. Uh, what you were saying about time a few minutes ago? Time of death? Mm. Never easy to set with certainty. But the prosecution had it that her last meal had been taken some two hours before she died. All to do with the digestive process stopping, the elements of food remaining in the stomach. They put it at between 7.15 and 8 o'clock. And Lundy was known to be with her around that time. We called her Dr. Livington, an expert witness in digestive matters and pathology, who argued that certain foods could remain in the stomach for over 12 hours, if not longer, when fear and shock had slowed the digestive process. Meaning she could have been killed much later. Well, you'll see Miss Bates found other expert opinion in support of this. Uh, oh, that's the turning I mentioned, just past the cake shop. And this is Beck Lane. Yes, it was about here that Diana got onto the crossbar of his cycle. They'd walked this far. He suggested giving her a lift. She wasn't too keen because of her new skirt. The blue one? Yeah. I'll go up a bit. Uh, oh, there's a gateway. I'll pull in there. Is this land used much? Or just the odd tractor? What on the summer with the visitors? We can walk from here. A moat bush is just round that bend ahead. So it must have been about here that the witness saw them standing together. Said he was touching her skirt. A Mrs. Shadrack lives in that house you can see on the rise. Would she see over that hedge? Well, she was upstairs, and he probably was touching her skirt. He was brushing dirt off. Yes, I remember. He said he, he said he wobbled, tipping them onto the grass verge, and that that was how he got the scratches on his arms and the particles of his flesh under her fingernails. Well, she grabbed at him to stop herself falling, yeah. as indeed anyone would. Mm. Oh, we know she was on the crossbar. There's a witness. So Mrs. Shadrack's testimony was correct. Factually, but... Not in its implication. Also, Mrs. Shadrack remembered the time, 7.20, on a bedroom clock. But Willie Gaunt, who used to live up ahead, said he waved to them when they passed him, walking together at 7.30, after Moat Bush. Evidence that they didn't stop there. Oh, more. Willie remembered the time because he had instructions to go indoors at 7.30 and had just been called in for being late. Now, Lundy was proved back in the marketplace at 7.55. A matter of time and opportunity again. Yes, I see. If Mrs. Shadrack was believed, Lundy would have had, say, 35 minutes. But if Willie was right, no more than 20 to pass Willie, come back here and commit the double crimes of murder and rape with all the peculiar circumstances you'll see in the moment. But Willie had associated with Lundy. He was only 10 at the time. And he was considered an unreliable witness. Yes, it's a good point. Tell me, did Diana ever get back on the bicycle again? No, she refused. They walked on round this bend and continued up to Nairs. But this is where they were supposed to have stopped. Where he was supposed to have rendered her unconscious. In this field? This is the field that leads into Moat Bush. Those trees over there. Hmm. I see now what Alison meant. About carrying her that distance? Mm, yes, she says Diana was very mature physically. Martin was slight. No more robust than me. And Diana was supposed to be unconscious, remember, which would mean she was even heavier. What was he doing with his bike all this time, I wonder? I mean, she'd hardly stand around while he hid it. And how did he make her unconscious without leaving any mark or indication? That is possible. It's a matter of pressure points. Quite. But to a 15-year-old orphan schoolboy. Mm. Oh, oh, doesn't it seem to suggest some sort of training in unarmed combat or, or something similar? He might have dragged her, but it would have shown. Well, there was a small laceration just below the right shoulder but no blood anywhere on the grass and no traces of feet or the sort of marks a dead weight being dragged would make. So she must have been carried mm -hmm. through the gate. Uh, there's a public footpath. Not that anyone much uses it anymore. 
Thanks. Uh, I'd better close it. Another interesting point. There was a blood stain on the blouse, the shirt. But it was not on the right side by the cut. It was in the centre of the front. Held over the cut, perhaps, to staunch it. But that means it would have been removed before crossing here. Apart from making the carrying that much harder, mm. uh, the copse is just over there through those trees. Yeah, she was lying just here, on her back. And that's the tree from which the branches were twisted, as the hotel manager told you. Hmm, like a big X. Deliberately. A third branch was twisted half off, but, but left hanging. Well, I can hardly reach up to where they were, you, you can just see. Mm. And Lundy was no taller than me. It would have needed a lot of strength, too. But why cover her that way at all? Well, it was all, uh, almost ritualistic. A strange orderliness, which was never explained. The shirt had been arranged to cover the face. The blue skirt had been folded carefully with the zipper pulled up and placed beside the body. The shoes equally carefully arranged beside it. The brassiere she wore was never found. And the pants were some distance away. Uh, about ten or twelve yards. Back there. Odd, that. Almost as odd as the lack of any ground disturbance. No footprints anywhere. No broken down undergrowth. Nothing on the earth or twigs. Not any sort of sign. It was as if they'd dropped from the sky and whoever did it had left the same way. As if it had been swept with a soft broom, leaving no trace. It was one of the things that intrigued me most. Difficult to see a kid of 15 having the, the nurse to clear up the signs that there must have been. If it was that sort of attack. Well, when the police arrived, there were just Danville's footprints and a small scuffed back earth mark besides each of her ankles. Which they tried to prove was the inside edges of Lundy's shoes. Not with any success. Hmm. And yet with all this, he was arrested and convicted. He was seen with her in this vicinity. No one saw her with anyone else, or said they did. No one had an alibi for him, or believed him. What about the forensic evidence, the body itself? Evidence of strangulation, the torn shirt round the neck, a small quantity of blood under the shoulder laceration, and an unbelievably small amount where it should have been conducive to undisputed evidence of a violent sexual attack, said to be while she was still alive but unconscious. And Lundy? Your man Limington argued, didn't he, that the lesions and bruising he had could be normal to any healthy developing boy? Not attributable to an inexperienced sexual attack, as the prosecution maintained. Hmm. Livington had served overseas as a forces M.O. He was conversant with rape cases. Well, at least I can perhaps see the reasons for Alison's theory. That she was attacked and murdered elsewhere, then brought back here. So much points to it. Mm, some of it does, anyway. The time element, the way things were left down here, the clothes... The briefs could have been dropped by accident if he was carrying her and them. The shirt used to staunch the cut shoulder. More particularly, the lack of blood where one would have expected it to be. And the means used for rendering her unconscious. So many things. What I don't see is why. Why risk bringing the body back here? Why chance being seen in that lane? Oh, not such a chance late at night. There are hardly any houses here and the area isn't overlooked in any way. In any case, courting couples park up here quite often, I understand. A, a car wouldn't look strange. Even so, having done what he'd done... Unless... Mm -hmm. Yes? Just suppose it was someone very familiar with this area. Someone who might have known she'd been with Martin Lundy that evening. And where? Providing a ready-made suspect. Yeah, it's a wild thought and a hell of a lot of supposition. Not so wild. Someone local... Someone older, taller, and stronger than Lundy. And someone with a psychotic personality. But if not Lundy, who? Well, she was a striking-looking girl, very short skirts and so on, and she had the erotic appeal of youth. Find the black car, and we'll know a lot more. Ah, yes. The car Lundy said she got into when they couldn't see the foals, and she left him. According to Lundy, she obviously knew the driver. He passed her on the Charrington Road, sounded his hooter, she waved, 
He reversed back. She spoke to him, then got in and was never seen alive again. The mysterious black car was never seen again either. True. But Lundy was adamant. He could see it all clearly from Nair's place. Which is further up the lane. Almost at the end of it. I'll, I'll take you. I... I don't care for this place. Understandable. But if you don't mind, I think I'd like to walk up. You'd prefer to? Give me time to think. I think you'll like this. Came back on Saturday, Mrs. Cuffin. It's her new one. Oh, yes, thank you. I like her books as a rule. I don't think there's anything else of interest here. I'll just have a look on the shelves, Mrs. Ames. <laughs> I should think you've been through everything up there. We should be getting a new batch in from County. Yeah. I'm afraid I read too much. Oh, well, it takes your mind off the humdrum. It helps. With your son, Lewis, away all the time now. And I suppose Mr. Culpin's out most of the day, too. There's not too much to do. I was only thinking, Lewis hadn't been home in a long, long time, has he? Home? Well, it's more difficult for him now. When was the last time I saw him? Must be, uh, oh... He has popped home. Not for long. Sunday sometimes. Oh. On Sunday. But <laughs> well, that's the life for a young man, though. The sea. All over the world like that. Finds it pretty dull when he does get home, I expect. Dull? Yes, yes, I suppose so. But not for you. But how old is Lewis now? He'll be 23 next month. 20? Three, is he? Oh, how they do grow. Good heavens. So that's who it was. Mm, I'm sorry. This book. Book? What is it? This photograph on the back. But don't they often have those on the cover? Oh, yes. Only I saw that face this morning. Saw it? Oh, in the book, you mean? No, here. Up the street, by the castle. Not an hour ago. I was out with Bess. I had a feeling he looked familiar. Who is he? Michael Reed. I've seen his face too often to be mistaken. He's here, in Ashlingham. Mm. He was talking with Reginald Farr on Castle Acre. And then he got into Mr. Farr's car and they drove off. Morning, gorgeous. Oh, you do have such good taste, Mr. Danville. I well, know. Uh, what are you doing behind reception? Where's Lorna? I'm having a quick drag. She's in the little girl's room. Oh. Some little thing I might do for you, Mr. Danville. I think I'm too old. Oh, my, my, we are unique. <laughs> Look, I left a recorded delivery for Mr. Reed, second post. The book needed signing. This one? Yeah, signed, is it? You want to keep that? Eh? His autograph. That's Michael Reed. I can read, can I? Don't tell me you ain't heard of Michael Reed, the writer. Have you? Mrs. Ames has, from the library. In here twittering all over the place this morning. Mm, a writer, is he? Who cares? He's like groovy. Hello, Mr. Danville. Got your book? Yeah, yeah, I got him. Oh, oh, busy day. Excuse me. Yeah, well, don't get carried away. Who do you think he would? You get worse. Funny man. Well, I'll see if we can find him. Uh, Mr. Reed. Dining room. Oh, a number of rang this morning, Jenny. Could he take the call? He was just looking at some papers when I came out. Oh. I'll tell him. Uh, uh, Mr. Jack Goodwin. I'm glad, Michael. Uh, tell me, did you get the transcript of Alison's tape notes this morning? Yeah, I've just been glancing through them. They look fine, Jack. Great help. Good. The uh, reason I rang, though, after we'd posted it, I found another reference. It wasn't with her notes, in among some bills and other papers I have of hers. Mm -hmm. it must have been made just before she died. Oh? Uh? Got a pencil? Uh, hang on. I've got the transcript here. There's not much room in these phone boxes. It's just a scrawled note on the back of a garage bill. You know she was American-born. She had no relatives over here. I've been sorting out her affairs. Uh, what's it say? It's a headed bill, Hewitt's Garage. On the back, she'd written Martin Lundy, then the name Robert Hewitt, followed by a dash, and then the words black car and a question mark. Robert Hewitt, dash, black car, mm -hmm. question mark. It does say black car. Yes. She told me there was some mystery about a car. That's why I thought it might be important. Maybe. Well, thanks for letting me know, anyway. How's it going? I'll let you know when I know. Sure, sure. Sorry. Must learn to curb my impatience. <laughs> that quote in my covering letter, by the way, I came across it in a trade sheet yesterday. Which quote? About a forthcoming book on the case. It was put out as part of our pending list before Alison died. But don't tell me the letter wasn't put in. 
Well, it was here. I saw it. It's just that I haven't read it too carefully yet. Here we are, sir. Hmm? Coffee. Oh, yeah. Oh, here, let me move that lot. Ta. You... You didn't notice if I left a letter in the dining room, did you? But there wasn't nothing there when I cleared. No, I expect it's amongst this lot somewhere. Never mind. Black or white? Black, please. Room number three? Three, yes. I hope I haven't kept you hanging about. I'm finished now till dinners anyway. Oh, then I have. I'm sorry. Don't matter. I've got nothing special to do. Oh, I don't believe it. Hmm? Attractive girl like you. Me? <laughs> You're joking. Can't be true. Or else there's something wrong with the young men of Ashlingham. There is. <laughs> and I'm particular. I'd say you could afford to be. Oh, I see you think so anyway. Um, I suppose I'd, uh, I'd better be going then. Oh, uh, Woodbridge. Is that very far from here? About ten miles. Oh, I thought I might go over there this afternoon. I sailed from there a couple of times. Lots of boats at Woodbridge. I, uh, I, I don't suppose you'd care to come with me. Me? I <laughs> know it's a liberty. It was only that I wasn't sure of the way, and uh, you did say you weren't... Uh... You mean it? Of course. I'd love to. Oh, we could have some tea, perhaps. I'd have to pop home first. Oh, you don't live in? Not in your life. Oh. Won't take a minute, though. Oh, that's all right. I'll need to get some petrol. I'll pick you up. Not here, though. Nosy lot here. Oh. Um, just through the marketplace, there's a small boutique on the corner. Uh, four, I think. And would you check the oil, please? Four gallons. Right out, sir. I see the old shelter's still there. What's it called now? Jacob's Well. Don't ask me why, though. Uh, nobody ever knew. Mr. Hewitt about? Not this minute. Uh, that, that'd be uh, Robert. Oh, Tad. Oh, I oh, thought... Bob's not been here for years. Is that so? You didn't mean Tad's son. <laughs> it's been a long time. Must have been. Bob used to work here with his old man, not for years, though. Moved on, has he? He got sense. Got into something better. Over at Lowestoft, didn't he? Oh, how long's he been there, then? Oh, about five years, I reckon. As long as that? Comes weekends sometimes. That's where Ted's gone now. Pick him up for Saks Munden. This weekend? Left his car last week for a respray. Come and pick it up. Oh, I may see him then. I tell him if you like. No, it doesn't matter. I'll probably see him around. He usually goes in the dolphin when he's home. Oh, well, in that case, I might see him there. Uh, I, I think the oil should be all right. But... He works for the Minister of Fisheries over at Lowestoft. Often at sea, diving, inspections. Doing very well for himself. Married a girl from there about three years ago. And lives there now? Yes. But why Robert Hewitt? Oh, I'm not sure. Just something Jack Goodwin said. Probably nothing at all. Can I help? Not unless you happen to know if he was around Ashlingham at the time. I understand he often comes back at weekends. Well, offhand, I don't. I could probably find out. Oh, so can I, I think. <laughs> I remembered what you said about Jenny. Ah, well, she'd know. While I'm here, tell me about Culpin. Bit of an extrovert, but quite popular, apparently. Why? Mary, the, last night he as good as said he didn't know the girl. Yet Brooke, the hotel manager, was sure he did. I just wondered about him, that's all. Odd sort of background overseas, as far as I can gather. But he's been living here for some considerable time. Used to farm locally. Sold up and formed the Ashlingham Cooperative Farmers, an association handling their produce and so forth. Married, I gather. Lucy Calpin. Mm, she seems a quiet, pleasant woman. My wife knows her better than me. Hasn't enjoyed good health in recent years. Or oh, so it seems. More nerves than anything, I think. Particularly since the boy's been away. What does he do? The son? Mm. Well, he's never here. Joined the Merchant Navy about five years ago. Radio, I think. His name's Lewis. She seems to miss him a lot. Hmm. Well, thanks again, Mr. Farr. There, um... <clears throat> Uh, there have been certain, um, well, rumours. Culpin? Uh, I, I don't want to spread gossip, but, uh, well, apparently a succession of young secretaries and always decorative uh, people must talk, it seems. I see. But that night, Culpin wasn't even here. He was away over at Norwich. Left here about four that afternoon with some salesman. Been looking for you. Oh, God. 
Sergeant, I wish you wouldn't do that. Guilty conscience, is it, Mr. Colpin? What have I done now? <laughs> Detective Inspector wants to bring a pal over from headquarters tomorrow. Bit of shooting. What the local police force would do without Ashlingham cooperative farmers to provide their support? <laughs> okay, I'll fix it. Yeah, you better, for both our sakes. Uh, but it wasn't that. It wasn't? What then? Well, this, um, firearms renewal of yours. What's the matter with it? Well, for one thing, your current license expires tomorrow. For another, well, this renewal's not signed, is it? Oh, God. Ten days ago she had it, that twitty girl. <laughs> Don't know that I'd say that. <laughs> oh, he's up your office. How do you always manage to get him so young and sexy? Can't afford anybody who can type. Well, there you are. Right. I'll get it put through and send it round. Thanks. Don't let it run out and then pinch me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thought. Just so Dead Sparrow. Tell him your old Reggie Farr was down in the bush this morning. No bush? Mm. Had this bloke with him. Who'd that be? Name of uh, Reed, they tell me. Reed? From the Crown, yeah? Oh, you know him. I uh, met him. Jed had a tractor up on his top meadow. Uh, saw them go through the gate into Moat Bush. There some time, he says, then Reed went walking up towards Nairs on his own. You people should tell Far once and for all to leave well alone. It's finished, judged and settled. He's got a bloody obsession. Miss Reed. Oh, I just saw him picking up young Jenny in his car. Jenny? Hmm, wonder why. Wouldn't have thought she'd been his type, would you? Sorry if I kept you waiting. It was worth it. Honest? You look delicious. Oh, you are nice, aren't you? It's funny. What is? Well, you uh, take me out and you don't even know my name. How about Jenny? How do you know that? Oh, I was, um... Interested? In me? Is that so surprising? Why, are you a famous writer and all. How did you know what I do? I was mm, interested. <laughs> Touché. What does that mean? It means uh, I'm flattered. I reckon you're putting me on. You must have a pick of girls down in London. Well, I wouldn't think you did too badly in Ashlingham. Oh, them. They're only after one thing. Oh, not that I'm against that at all, I'm not. But, as you said, you're particular. I like a man with experience and style, nice manners, who knows how to treat a girl properly. Know what I mean? I think so. You see it? Mm -hmm. You could sail anywhere in the world in that. It's a catch rig. You see the two masts? Mm -hmm. That's a real boat, and enough twin diesel power to get you into port anywhere. Oh. You know so much about things. Oh, not really. Bits here and there. Things I've come across haphazardly. <laughs> you and your big words. Well, how about tea? That's not a big word. It was a nice place up Church Street. Lead on, then, Duchess. You see, that's what I mean about treating a girl properly. It makes her feel good. And funny inside. And that's because you need that tea. Well, come on. So the librarian told you. Oh, goose pimple she was, raving on about Michael Reed. What did she want, anyway? I don't know. Probably wants you to talk to her women. She's done that before with people staying. Her women? Mixed up in everything she is. All long hair and program three. Right weirdy she is. You <laughs> make her sound charming. <laughs> Bet she wouldn't have been so goosey she'd known what I know. Oh? And what's that? Why Mr. Michael Reed is here. Hmm. Tell me. She was dead set against what that Bates woman was doing. Most of them were. Jenny, suppose you tell me. That letter, the one you lost. You found it? I didn't. Somebody else did, though, and handed it in after you'd gone. Old Brooke and our receptionist, they read it. Oh, did they? I heard them. About you writing a book about the murder. About Lundy. I see. Is that right? Do you want some more tea? Is it? And if it is. I'll pour on the professional. Are you going to? I don't know yet, Jenny. I might, and I might not. If you did, would that mean you'd stay here longer? Probably. Oh, I'd like that. You ought to ask me. Ought I? Perhaps you meant to, though. Perhaps that's why you asked me out, N not because you like me. <laughs> You're very shrewd, Jenny. But also very attractive and very pleasant to be with. Honest? Do you mean it? Honest. I was in it. 
I could tell you a thing or two. About London? About a few of them here. Might make you think less of me, though. Well, I'm not exactly doddery, you know. Yeah, but I wouldn't like that. Diana King was your friend, wasn't she? Sort of. And she weren't the sweet little innocent they made out, neither. No? Not that you get much chance. They're always at it, always trying it on. The old ones are just as bad, worse. Even old Brooke, especially if you're young. Um, can I have a cigarette? Oh, sorry, I didn't think. Thanks. Would I be in it, in the book? Would you mind if you were? It depends. Oh, ta. Wouldn't worry me. How did you first meet Lundy? Swimming pond. He just turned up one night. We used to go there a lot then in summer. Who was we? Oh, me and Diana, a couple of other girls. Mm -hmm. And the local boys, I suppose. Mm. Had to keep everything clutched tight down there, I can tell you. <laughs> Jenny, did Alison Bates talk to you about this? Didn't tell her anything. Why not? Don't know. Didn't feel like it. But if you want to ask me... You don't mind talking about it? Why should I? I'm not like that, law. It happened, didn't it? Wasn't my fault. Besides. Mm hmm. Well, means you'll want to see me, doesn't it? I think I mightn't have known you if you hadn't lost that letter. Letter? I don't understand. What, what letter? Is oh, no, thanks. Oh, Ted was telling me just before I came out to the flower oh, club. Mrs. Culpin. No, no, thank you. I knew he was a writer, of course, but it never occurred to me. But that I don't see how that proves. From a publisher. Uh, well, Ted had to read it, of course, sir. How else would he have known as it was? Edna, what did it say? Well, it mentioned that Alison Bates several times. Said they were enclosing the, um, oh, something or other of her notes on the Martin Lundy case. That if Reed decided to use them and, and write the book... Oh, no. Well, that's not all. Sergeant Lee was telling Ted that Reed was out with Reginald Farr this morning. They were down in Moat Bush together. I told you I saw them. I can't believe it. All starting up. Not again. Awful memories. Everyone reading about this town in that way. Oh, it's humiliating. I thought when Miss Bates... I thought it would be all forgotten. Not that I wished her any... Oh, why can't they leave us in peace? One thing, he'll not get much change out of Ashlingham. We're forewarned this time. I'm not so sure. There are some who wouldn't be averse to a little cheap publicity. Do you mind? Getting a bit uppity, aren't we? Excuse me, Mr. Culpin. I'm busy. Enjoy your ride? What you on about? Let me buy. You always did enjoy a car ride. Not half as much as you did. Good driver, is he, Mr. Reed? At least he keeps both eyes on the road. Must have been a disappointment for you. What's it to you, anyway? Asking questions, was it? Wouldn't you like to know? They say he's taking over from that Bates woman. That right? Thought you were telling me. Is he? How would I know? Think we've got nothing better to talk about than that? All right, Jen. Get your phone if that's what you want. We've had enough of snoopers. You remember that if he should come ask you. Jenny was sure about it. I've just left her. Robert Hewitt? Hmm. Are you sure? Now, Jenny says he was definitely in Ashlingham that day. She saw him and spoke to him. I've known Robert since he was born. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, Mr. Farr. But Alison didn't seem given to fanciful conjectures. Indeed, she wasn't. Which at least suggests she was in contact with him in some way. Just the name with the words black car. And a question mark. I know she spent a considerable time trying to trace that car. It was the missing factor, the crux of any case for Lundy. Hmm. Well, I called at the garage earlier. Seems he's home at the moment. And what do you intend to do? I thought I might drop into the Dolphin later. It's his local. He still goes there when he's home, apparently. Ah. Might be useful, though, if we could make sure he went there tonight. You want me to try and do something? Uh, you, you say he has an unusual job, this diving. Yes. Well, perhaps I could be an old friend of yours, a, a writer interested in background material. Lucy, are you there? What are you doing up here? What's the matter with you? Huh? Oh, God, we're not in for another of your sessions. Go away. Just leave me in peace. This your idea of peace? It's the only thing I have. Be proud of you, wouldn't he? Sat there, staring at his photograph. You want to pull yourself together. Neurotic, that's what you're becoming. Are you surprised? And what's that supposed to mean? You think I haven't had cause? 
I don't know what the hell you're on about. No. Go away. Gladly, if you're going to sit mooning up here. Go back to your drinking pals. Back to your... Go on. To my what? Finish it. It's all happening again. With you it is. It's never stopped, really. I just Oh, hope... for God's sake. Mr. Farr, and now this man, Reed. Reed? It's all starting again. The scandal, the shame. They'll find out. They're sure to find out. Reed, this bloke at the crime... You told me. You told me you went over to Norwich that night. To Norwich in somebody's car. Oh, I see. It's that again. To Norwich, you said. You just never give up, do you? My God. You told me that. Me who's lived with you for nearly 30 years, God help me. Who stood by and watched you debase yourself. Insult me as your wife. Your son, even. You keep on this way, you'll get certified. Leaving early to look at schoolgirls riding by in their short skirts. Ogling them at games. Schoolgirls. Bits of kids who call secretaries. Now shut up, Lucy, you hear me? And coming home to find you. In our own house. With our own niece. That was the end. One mistake. One innocent mistake. And a lark. Not at all like you make it sound. And you, you can't let me forget it, can you? All those years ago. You're evil. Just plain bloody evil. Oh, yes, me. Not the big popular Len Culpin. Me, his wife. A wife he hasn't wanted to know as a wife for... How long is it? Can I help it if you're always tired, sickening for something or other? Can I? So instead it's ogling schoolgirls. Lucy, I'm warning you. You weren't at Norwich that night. You weren't anywhere near Norwich. You weren't a mile from this house. And what happens if this valve jams in some way? Oh, you begin to pray hard. I see him. So that could be it. Well, that's great. That's just what I wanted. I'm very grateful, Mr. Hewitt. It was a pleasure. Uh, Mr. Farr said it was for a story. A novel. Well, when I get round to it, that is. So will I be able to read it? I'll send you a copy. Would you? Hmm. Can I get you another pint or something else? Oh, I still got this one, thanks. I may have a job to do here first, though. In Ashlingham? Yeah. Mm. This, um, this murder about four years ago. Oh? You remember it? Of course. Diana King. Could be. You knew her. I wouldn't say that exactly. Saw her around a lot before I went away. Mm -hmm. Very attractive, they tell me. Yeah, she was. Bloody shame. There's some idea of a book about the case and the trial and so on. A book? Mm. Well, the old man told me, um, Miss Bates, but uh, I thought, well, she's dead, isn't she? Unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've been going through the notes and things that she was working on. Her publisher happens to be my publisher as well. Oh, I see. You, you knew Miss Bates? Well, when I worked for the old man at the uh, garage, she used to bring a car in for service and the like, but... Uh, well, I've been over at Lowestoft last five years. Oh, so of course you wouldn't have been here when it happened? No. Pity. For a minute, I thought you might have been able to help me yet again. Oh, no, I was back at Lowestoft by that time. Back? Well, I was here that day. I had a couple of days off. Oh, you were, you were in Ashlingham? Yeah, I had to go back that night. Left here soon after six. Uh, so while you were still on the train, probably all this was... In the car. I was driving back. But you avoided it all. Well, when I read it in the paper a couple of days later, well, it's knocked over, I can tell you. When it's someone you know... Yes, it... brings it home. Uh, Do you ever meet Martin Lundy? Or the kid who did it? No. I was only home now and then, odd day, a weekend. I knew all the others, though. Kids who were there, old Danville, you know. Mm. Alison Bates had a theory about it. Well, that he didn't do it. Yeah, I know. She talked to most of the people involved. Mm, she talked to me once. Oh, did she now? Mm, a couple of months back, I suppose. We were home for the weekend, and the old man was busy, so uh, I delivered her car back for him. Told her what I just told you about leaving here early that day. And what did she say to that? A uh, funny thing. She, she wanted to know what colour my car was. I didn't realise why at the time. But you do now? Yeah. I told her, navy blue. You uh, you didn't know that a car was supposed to have been around that night? Well, I was away in a course soon after it happened, and by the time I got home again, it had all been over a long time. Oh. Wasn't anything in the papers about no car. Lundy claimed she got into one when she left him. Black, he said. Yeah, I know that now. I thought about it after. It seemed a damn screwy thing to ask. And then I remembered. Remembered what? What about the car? Must have been the only one I saw between here and Yoxford and the A12 that night. It's parked outside the Sibden Bell, about five miles from here. A black car? 
shouldn't have thought any more about it if she hadn't asked about mine. I mean, you see park cars all the time, don't you? So what made you remember this one? Well, I knew it, didn't I? You recognised it? Yeah, of course. It used to service it. I went, wow, inside now. Other reason, I thought I'd stop there for a drink, then I decided to get on low stuff first. And what time would it have been? Oh, must have been around 6.30, quarter seven-ish. Did you tell Miss Bates about this? Didn't get a chance. Didn't think of it till later, did I? Anyway, next time I was home, she was dead. Yes, I see. That wasn't important anyway. Wouldn't have meant anything. Well, why not? Why? Oh, well, it's only old Lynn Culpins, wasn't it? Culpins? Are you sure? Yeah, certain. I think he runs a red Cortina now, but it was the only car there anyway. But I've been on to Ipswich already this morning, Sergeant. This is terribly important. Only wish I could help you, Mr. Farr. And headquarters tell me Detective Inspector Carter is likely to be coming here today to Ashlingham. I expect they'd know, sir. Well, I must get in touch with him. Matter of new important evidence. It's urgent. So you said, sir. Where can I find him? A D.I. seldom takes me into his confidence. Why are you being so abstractive? He knows this case. I'll tell you what, Mr. Farr. Don't see why he should, but if the D.I. does call in here, I'll tell him you phoned. About the best I can do. And uh, check the tyres, if you would, Fred. Sure. 27 front, 25 back. Trip around the houses today. How is she running? Oh, all right. Still got that bloody squeak. Oh, I... Uh, is that Robert I can see in the workshop? Yeah. Uh, book it all, will you? Hey, Robert. Back again, then. Morning, Mr. Corbett. Can't stay away, can you? No. It's the gay nightlife. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, yours? Yeah, it's been resplashed. Yellow. The young gold. But don't you like it? Oh, you, I suppose. Hardly me, I reckon. A bit jaundiced. <laughs> Well, it says it's for the young and bold. <laughs> yeah, it's funny seeing you this morning, though. Always glad to give pleasure. Your ears twitching last night? No more than usual. Why? Talking about you last night. Yeah? How was that, then? I still can't agree about the police. But this is vital. At least it has to be checked. All right. So, according to Hewitt, Culpin had his car out that night. And a black one at that. But don't you see, Calpin swore his car never left his garage. When all local vehicles were checked at the time, he swore he locked it away at lunchtime and never used it again that day. I do see, but it still doesn't The mean... important factor is why he should lie so blatantly about it. Now, when you telephoned last night, I, I couldn't rest. It's fresh evidence. It could make sense out of Lundy's claim. Perhaps. Or at the very least, it could mean a question of reasonable doubt. Or it could mean that Calpin had something to hide, maybe. But not necessarily murder. I only said reasonable doubt. But that's all we need in order to act. He certainly knew the girl. I asked Jenny at breakfast time. Yet you said he denied it. Rather, he didn't seem anxious to admit it. But it seems he knew her fairly well. Well enough to be giving her rides in his car. What? Jenny remembers. In fact, she was with her on one occasion. There you are, then. Not enough, is it? Oh, but surely. Well, is it? We know Diana was in his car on several occasions. That she knew him. That, according to Jenny, whom I'm inclined to believe, by the way, he favours young girls, young secretaries, schoolgirls, apparently, and Jenny herself. But he's not alone in that. And it certainly doesn't make him a rapist. And Robert Hewitt, you said he impressed you. Now, why should he lie? Look, Carpin could have had a dozen reasons for the car business. I'm not trying to play down any possibilities. I know what a break like this means to you. I merely say that to be over-eager at this stage... Ah, you're right, of course. Matter of optimism, marring judgment. But what do we do? You told me he was supposed to have left here that day at about four. Was his alibi ever checked? Why should it have been? No one was caught upon to provide one. Lundy was the only one suspected. Culpin said he was in Norwich, I seem to remember, but no one was really interested. Mm. It's a bit dicey four years later. Well, that's why I wanted to contact Carter. Detective Inspector now, sergeant on the case at the time. But that fool Sergeant Lee won't tell me where he's going to... Yes? Lucy, it's Len. Why don't you answer the phone? I am answering. I've been hanging on here. Look, this is the third time I've rung. I was upstairs. Never mind. Now, listen. You may get somebody round 
Asking damn fool questions about the car. Car? What's happened? The old one, asking about the day that King girl was... Questions? Uh, about where my car was that night. Uh, you listening? Why? But why, after all this time, why questions? For God's sake, just listen. Who? Tell me who... If they do, you know where it was, don't you? Uh, do I? God, of course you do. It was in the garage, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yes. Yes, in the garage. From lunchtime on. I didn't use it until the next day, did I? No. Len, I'm frightened. Frightened? Why the hell should you be? Oh, nothing. Pull yourself together. Oh, it's always that. Guys, I've got to get over to Woodbridge now. Damn meeting late on. But I'll be back early evening. Then I'll find that bastard Reed. <laughs> Reed? As far. See you then. And don't forget. <sighs> Oh, God. Detective Inspector Carter. That's right. Sit down, Inspector. Can I order you coffee or a drink? No, thanks. I happen to be parson, so I thought I'd stop by to offer you a little advice, Mr. Reed. Well, now, that's very considerate, Inspector. I hear you may be taken over from the late Alison Bates in resurrecting the Martin Lundy case. Now, where could you have heard that, I wonder? I've read some of those books. I don't hold with them. No? They upset people. Stir things up, cause more trouble for people innocently involved who might prefer to forget. That's the unfortunate thing about fate, Inspector. It has no boundaries. Of course, I know there are so-called writers who make their pickings digging up salacious dirt at other people's expense. Hacks, don't they call them? You're perfectly entitled to your criticisms, of course. Nothing better than a good, powerful sex crime. And if it happens to be an attractive young girl, so much the better, eh? Nothing sells quite like that, does it? No matter who gets hurt in the process. I'd certainly be interested to know which books you've read. Obviously the wrong ones. There are quite a number of serious crime studies, well written and accepted as authoritative. Maybe. I knew what Alison Bates was trying to do, of course, but not why. Maybe she was misguided enough to consider she had a cause, like Reginald Farr. And you don't think he has a cause? I think he's a good man out of his depth, right from the start. A well-meaning man, unable to live with the fact that he was proved at fault in back and a wrong one. Hmm. He couldn't still be trying to help the boy. By screaming that old bogey of injustice. I was on that case as Detective Sergeant, Mr. Reed. Lundy was as guilty as hell. Proved by every shred of evidence, and nothing can alter that fact. In which case, he'll stay where he belongs, won't he? I think you're being influenced by the heart, not the head. It was no problem case. Andy Keslin was a good jack, the best. He was in charge of the case? Detective Inspector Keslin. I was his sergeant and his friend. He's sick now, pensioned off, and I wouldn't want to see his reputation dragged into useless controversy. Inspector, supposing I were to tell you... No guess... point. Leave well alone, Mr. Reed. I've read your books. You don't need this sort of muck. Well, which is all I stopped by to say, so uh, good day to you, sir. But, Inspector... Good day, Mr. Reed. Yes, Mr. Sir. Susan, that call to Mrs. Calpin. There's still no reply. You've been trying. Oh, sir, so four times. What time was it when she rang? And you say she didn't give any idea what she wanted? No, no, just said she'd like to speak to you. I told her you were out and she said it didn't matter. You told her I'd be back? Oh, yes. All right, Susan, keep trying, will you? Going out, sir? Oh, hello, Jenny. Uh, I thought I might, yes. There's a leaflet about the castle. Over here, sir. A what? Over here, sir. Oh, oh, yes, yes, I, I see. Uh, thanks. What was all that about? Listen, they're going to ask you to leave tomorrow. Leave? They're going to say they've got a prior booking for your room. Well, they haven't. That's old Mother Brooke. She's been at him, she and her harpies. Well, because of the Lundy thing. I told you what they were like. They're dead against her. <laughs> Kicked out. Don't go. Will I have any choice? Well, that's what I wanted to tell you. I, I know where you... Well, that's if you wanted to. I, I told you I got this flat. It's nothing much, and... Well, you needn't think you've got a... I mean... Jenny, you're very sweet. I'm not. But I don't want you to go away. I've got to, anyway. But not yet. I'm afraid so. But don't think I'm not grateful and... honoured. I am. But you won't? No, Jenny. 
I'd really have to leave anyway. Ah, I see. But thanks. I'll see you later, won't I? You really going now? Well, I think I might go up and have a look at your castle, having studied this leaflet so diligently. At this time? Why not? Yeah, the DI's been up with Bill Robbins. Brought some mate over for a bit of shooting. Oh, I'm meeting him in the crown. Yeah, oh, I recognised him. He's getting fat. Ah, detective inspectors don't have to pound around like us peasants. You going in? The crown? Mm, later, perhaps. No, if Len Colton will be in. No idea. Ah, just been up to his place. Well, his office shuts at five. His house. Got this firearms license of his. Promised to drop it in. I rang the bell, but couldn't get no reply. Oh, he wouldn't have been home. Well, somebody was. There was a light at the back. Ah, oh, well, probably didn't hear me. Oh, I thought I saw him standing up by the castle a few minutes ago. Ah, well. If he comes in, he can have it then. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't stick it through the box. <laughs> Could have. This fading light. You can almost imagine them still standing watch up here, can't you? I've been looking for you, Reed. Of course. Otherwise, why follow me? Though you could have found me at the hotel. This is better. On top of the castle wall? Much better. Nobody to listen. Nobody to see. Well, of course, if you feel you need that sort of privacy. He's supposed to shut the front gate at dusk. It's not too safe up here, you see. Not in bad light. Parts of the wall are missing. Just a handrail. These planks... Not very wide. So I noticed. There are warnings up. A fall from here could be nasty. Mm, damn nigh fatal, I should think. Like I said, we're better. I see. But isn't that the caretaker's house down there in the courtyard? Getting old now. A bit deaf. I know his habits. He didn't see me come in. Yeah, but well, I think you've made your point. You're bright. For a sneaky bastard, you're bright. I wish I could say the same for you. I came up here to think. Now I'm thinking a man who threatens violence and murder so easily could have done so before. Now we are getting to it. The only thing is, I'm bigger and stronger than a 15-year-old girl. You bastard. And considerably fitter and younger than you. So don't push your luck again. I want to know what the hell you're up to. <laughs> it can't be conscience after all this time. This morning, Bob Hewitt, he told me about you last night and my old car. So you follow me up here in the dark like some... Th and asking questions. You're trying to fix me with that murder, you and Far. He wouldn't care who, so long as that filthy kid got free. But it's not going to be me. I mean, it's a cliche, but if you've nothing to hide, you've nothing to worry about. I never touched her. Not like that. I never did. Then you've got a funny way of selling yourself. What do you think you're at? Do I look, do I act like a bloody murderer? As of this moment... Think I could carry on here with that for four years, do you? How should I know? If I'd done that, I'd, I'd have been gone years ago. It depends what sort of man you are. I told them. They asked me, I told them. My car was never out that night. Hewitt says it was. And he's a bloody liar. He says it was parked outside the Sipton Bell at about 6.30. He wasn't even here when it all happened. He knew nothing about any car. Why should he lie? How the hell should I know why? He knew your car. He'd driven it, serviced it. Exactly the color and type of car Lundy said picked up Diana King. Just before she was raped and murdered. How many times do I have to say it? My car never left my garage. But you did know Diana King. So did a couple of thousand other people here. Half of them men. And she used to go out in all their cars too? What's that supposed to mean? Wait a minute. Of course. That nympho down at the crown. <laughs> I should have known. Been offering it to you too, Ashley. Are you going to believe that little tease? I didn't say I believed anyone. Oh, all right, so I knew her. I gave her a ride in the car now and then. What about it? So have others. I liked her, sure, but that's all. I'll even admit it. I like younger girls, but she probably told you that as well. It has been said. I'm not all that proud of it, but that doesn't mean I go around doing what you're accusing me of. I'm not accusing anyone. It's not up to me in any way. I swear that car never left my garage. I can prove it. Oh? If I have to. But I think you may have to, sooner or later. At least my wife can. But it's... It's tricky. Well, she... She knows all about, well, what I've just admitted, and she knows where I was that night. Then you've got no problems. I told her I'd been taken over to Norwich. The salesman. I had to tell her something. She knew I'd known this kid and others, and she thought... Yeah, even her, just because I... made herself ill. 
In the end, I had to tell her. She found out later anyway. The girl was working for me at the time. I was never out that evening. Ask my wife. She knows the car was at home all night. She knows where I was. Ask her. I'm afraid somebody may have to. You, now. Come home with me now and ask her. Now, look, I told you, it's not up to me. I'm not a detective or a judge. You started this, you and Far, and I want it cleared up for good. Lorna? Mrs. Colpin hasn't been in when I was out. Uh, no, Mrs. Brooke. She didn't ring. Not that I know, and I've been here all afternoon. That's funny. We were supposed to meet at Mrs. Ames' cottage. We should pop in at lunchtime. Well, she didn't come upstairs. No, she's looking for Mr. Reed. Looking for Reed? Well, I asked her if she wanted you, and she said no. And she said she wanted Mr. Reed? Yes. Well, did she see him? Well, he was talking to Inspector Carter. She wouldn't wait. Strange. We're supposed to be talking about a protest meeting against this book. Yeah, she did seem a bit edgy. Especially when I told her who he was talking to. Just turned and, and went. Is Reed in the hotel now? Uh, he went out about an hour ago. Has he been told? About his room. Not yet. I see. Where's Mr. Brooke? Look, you've got to understand she's a bit, well, run down, nervy, and I'm not exactly a favourite. She's scared stiff of any sort of scandal, always has been. And since the boy's been away, she's alone a lot. Well, just remember this was your idea. Well, come in. If you wait a minute, I'd better tell you you're here. Oh, look at that. Left the phone off the hook now. I wonder how long that's been lying there. Lucy, you there? Probably upstairs, taking to sitting up there lately. That's funny. Look, I suggest you talk to Mr. Farr. Oh, she must be somewhere. Has to be. Well, she could have gone out, of course. With the lights left on? You don't know Lucy. Besides, she never, ever goes out in the evenings anymore. It'll come through. Look, I, I, th I think it'd be better... Look, you started this. You're going to ask her. Well, she's obviously delayed somewhere. At mealtime? She wouldn't let herself be. Maybe she's in the kitchen. Lucy! God! What is it? Bloody stove, nearly red hot. Yes, I can smell it. Chimney and bottom wide open. Draft control. Oh. Is there anything I can do? That that, that cloth. Yeah. Hot as hell. Yeah. Ah. That's it. Look at that chimney. Been rolling its head off God knows how long. It's lucky you caught it. What in God's name has she been doing? Look at it. Charred papers all over. Old letters or something. Are you sure that'll be all right? Well, now. Let's, let's get out of this stink. <laughs> Must have been like that for hours. Well, at least you should be all right for hot water. But she doesn't make that sort of mistake. Oh, anybody could. Not Lucy. She's overcautious, always has been. Everything right and in its place. There's something wrong. And it's not just that stuff. What do you mean? Well, her not being here. The lights on, the phone taken off the hook. The way she's been lately, not sleeping, sitting up there staring at his photograph for hours on end. And now this. And burning old letters. Well, there must be an explanation of some sort. I know her. I tell you, there's something wrong. I know there is. <laughs> I tell you, I reckon I could have got more with a trunch. Oh, you didn't do too bad, Inspector. Not for a townie. I think not. <laughs> there's damn things move faster every time I come here. Yeah, they do say it's the water. Yeah, I have the same trouble with his beer. <laughs> well, that's charming, I must say. It's back there. Do you have a minute? You look worried, Sergeant. What's up? Another lightless bike on the rampage? That was the wife on the phone. <laughs> oh, checking up on you, is she? Oh, we just had a call. From Len Colton's place. Well, Lucy been beating old Len up again. No. <laughs> uh, seems Mrs. Colton's missing. Uh, eh? What? Missing? It was this here bloke Reed on the phone. Seems he'd gone back there with Len. How do you mean, missing? For some hours, they reckon. Was she really here at lunchtime? In the hotel? Wife told me she'd come in to see Reed. Reed again. But you were talking to him, so she never waited. That ain't all. They found some sort of note. Suicide? Not exactly. I was a wondering, sir, if. You shouldn't look into this one. Oh, hello, Mr. Farr. 
Anything further? Not since I phoned. And Carter's here? Yes, he's through there, talking to Culpin. They've set up some sort of search, but so far they've no idea where to look. How's Culpin taking it? Stunned. He was pretty sure when he found the son's photograph was missing. And then we found the message. So she knew. Mm, she knew something. Oh, yeah. that poor woman. I'm sorry, Reed. Couldn't be more unfortunate that this should have happened. But for me and my damned book, it seems to be the feeling, all right? Well, who could foresee something like this? Yes. Well, let's hope they find her. You last spoke to her on the phone this morning. Yes. What time was that? It must have been just after ten. After I'd been to Hewitt's when they told me. Told you what? About the car. Ask him. Ask Reed. Ah, uh, Mr. Farr, you're here. Oh, Inspector, I, I hope you don't mind. Depends whether you can help or not, don't it? Mr. Culpin, I'm sorry. You should be. You've driven her to this. That's not true. It doesn't matter what, does it? Anything to get that filthy kid off. Any bloody thing, no matter who else suffers. I can understand your distress. He may but... well have a point, Mr. Farr. But I understand there was a note, Inspector. Doesn't that seem to suggest... It suggests Mrs. Culpin is missing. Well, may I see it? Why not? It was scrawled on this pad by the telephone. Good, so she didn't know what she was doing. Read and his bloody accusations. The only one that knows. I'm the only one that can harm him. Harm who, Mr. Culpin? Listen, I... Right, I then, all right. I'm more concerned with finding Mrs. Culpin at the moment. Now, what's this about a car? Robert, you had told me he'd seen Mr. Culpin's previous car, a black one in the vicinity on the night Diana King was murdered. He's a bloody liar! Who's Robert Hewitt? Oh, son of the garage owner. He used to work there, knew the car well. Mr. Culpin heard I'd been talking to Hewitt, and uh, he approached me about it. I tell you, Just I... a minute. That's why you telephoned your wife this morning. I didn't want him coming round here scaring her silly. She'd already been upset by him and his ridiculous... You had approached Mrs. Culpin? I've never met her. Culpin said his wife could prove his car had never been out of his garage that night. He insisted that I came back here with him to ask her. What is this, Sergeant? Uh, nothing out there, sir. Mm. And you've still no idea where she might have gone, then? No. No, I don't know. Friends? I phoned those that she might have gone to see. What about relatives? No. No, not Lucy. Not, not, not here. Now, look, Len, go up with the sergeant here and take another look round upstairs. What then. for? I looked up there. See if there's anything you've missed. Anything that she could have taken with her. His photograph. Anything else? Clothes, a case, anything. Why should she? Let's take a look, Lan. You never know. She hasn't gone anywhere. I know, Lucy. She's dead, I know. Come on, Lan. Come on. Satisfied, Mr. Reed? Why should I be? I seem to remember warning you this morning what this sort of muckraking could do. Now, that's damnably unfair, Inspector. Is it? Why do you think this has happened, then? Well, are you suggesting that fresh evidence should always be concealed because of the misfortune the truth might cause? The truth, Mr. Farr? Well, what Mr. Reed discovered could be of vital importance. Were we supposed to ignore it? Lundy's phantom black car, I suppose. Well, I don't know. That's for you to find out. I'm glad to hear you say so. Also, why Culpin lied about his car at the time. If he did. And kept quiet about it since. In any case, don't you think you should have told us... I tried of... to tell you this morning, if you remember. You didn't want to know. And neither did Sergeant Lee when I tried to find out where you'd be. So, tell me now. No, oh, there isn't much else. A note was found, left by Alison Bates. It had Robert Hewitt's name, and next to it, the words Black Car. I think she might have thought it was Hewitt's own car. So I asked Hewitt about it. He remembered seeing Culpin's black car parked at the Sipton Bell when he was on his way back to Lowestoft at about 6.30 that night. And that's all? Except that apparently Culpin knew the girl well. She'd been on petting drives with him. Petting drives? So I was told by someone who had been with her. Hmm. Yeah, you said you didn't know Mrs. Culpin. That's right. Then why would she be looking for you at the Crown this morning? For me? I didn't know she was. Came in while I was talking to you. Asked the reception girl, then left. I've no idea. Well, she telephoned me this afternoon. What time was that? Well, about half past three. I tried all afternoon to ring her back, but the line was engaged every time. Yes, we found the phone off the hook when we got here. Culpin rings her, tells her about this car thing, then she tries to see both of you between, say, 12 and 3.30. Sergeant Lee called here with a firearms license just after five. He thought there was someone here then. The lights were on. It must have been around six when we got here. That stove had been left on for some hours then. If she had known all these years, or even suspected, questions about the car, then she sees you two talking together. Later, Sergeant Lee calls around here... 
in the state her mind must have been in, God knows what she might have done. Calpin said he'd been worried about her health for some time. He said she used to spend hours sitting up there in... Here? Yeah. Inspector. What is it? Uh, Len, uh, M Mr. Culpin's just had a thought where she might have gone. Well? Well, it was only an idea, but he wondered if she could have gone back to their old farm. Where's that? A few miles out. Apparently she was always talking about the place, didn't want to leave it. The boy was born there. Well, there's something anyway. Bring him along, will right, you? Right, Can we be of any help? Not at the moment, but I may want to see you later, Mr. Reed. I shall be at the hotel. I hope so. Well, it's possible, I suppose. Perhaps. Now, you started to say something a moment ago. Yes, I just had a thought. You see, I'm wondering now... I'm wondering now if it was Culpin she was concerned about. Now, why do you say that? He told me earlier that he believed she suspected him at one time. So much so that he finally had to tell her where he really was that night. Well, he said Norwich. Yeah. And he told me that he was in Ashlingham, shacked up with some young girl working for him at the time. He went back with her straight from the office. He didn't leave her until very late. You believe it? Well, it could have been a try at an alibi. Not easy to disprove after this time. Now I'm inclined to think that that's where he could have been. But, surely, the note... Well, it doesn't name Culpin. It merely says that she was the only one who could harm him. She was the only one who knew. Now, what are you getting at? It was something else he said. Something Culpin said? Yeah. And something she did. <laughs> if I'm right... Well, it's just an idea. But if it helps to find Mrs. Culpin... Well, it could do more than that. I'll need to make a call on the way. Why? Uh, uh, where are we going? But he used to be around with you girls at the swimming pond and so on. Used to be. What was he like? Randy. Jenny. <laughs> I mean as a person. Well, he was. Thought he was God's gift to the poor peasant girls. A bit weird with it, too, you know. Is that true? <laughs> I ought to know. But you also told them you knew about Lundy, too, in that way. Well, they kept asking me, didn't they? Anyway, I told you about that. Yes, you did. So you'd have known Diana pretty well, then? Knew her well enough. Why? But you still say he wasn't around that day. He couldn't have been, could he? Uh, well, anyway. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks a lot. And that's all you came for? It was important. Mr. Farr's waiting outside. Is he? Mm. Good night, Jenny. And thanks again. I, are you... Am I what? Will you honestly be going away tomorrow? Yeah, I plan to. But I shall see you before I go. Yeah. Night, Jenny. Night. I, uh, I wish we'd waited for Carter. Mm. It looks as if it's just as well we didn't. I still don't understand your reasoning. Moat Bush... I'd have thought that the very last place. Well, it was you who mentioned her state of mind. I figured, under the circumstances, she just might have felt drawn to where it happened. To, to, to where her world disintegrated. Hmm. Obviously, I was wrong. It's even worse in moonlight. What's round there? Just beyond those trees? Mm, called the Mears. A deep pond. Floods badly in winter. Now, look, Reed, I... uh, uh, let, Let's just take a look and then we'll go. Must we? Will you wait here, if you like. No, 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 if you're going. But take the torch if you need it. Well, it's not that I can't see. What? Over there. My God, you were right. Just standing there by the pond. Something in our hands. It'll be the photograph. What do we do? Try not to scare her. Can you go back by yourself? I, uh, I suppose so. I'll stop here. Try and bring someone who knows her. Who's that? Oh, she's seen us. You're too late, whoever you are. You're too late. Go when I move out. I've got to stop her. You'll never find out from me. I'll never let him down. It's all right, it's all right, Mrs. Culpin. Don't be afraid. I have a message for you. No, no, you'll make me tell. A message from Lewis. <laughs> From... From Lewis? Yes, that's right. From your son. 
from my son? Well, Inspector? Under sedation now, but the doctor says she should be all right. Ah, that's good news. Given time, and thanks to Mr. Reed. No, hardly. No, I owe you an apology, sir. Seems you too, Mr. Farr. It was the son, then. Apparently he came home on leave unexpectedly that evening. She let him take the car, but Culpin knew nothing about it. But he must have known Lewis had been home. Not until tonight. She says the boy seemed strange when he came home some hours later. Said he had to leave immediately, changed his clothes and went. Culpin never saw him. And how did she find out? She was puzzled by his odd manner. Thought he might have pranked the car, so she went to look after he had gone and found the brazier. So that's why it was never found. She suspected Culpin at first. She's known of his peculiarities for a long time. Then when fuller details got out, she realized what the bra could mean. She burned it and the clothes the boy had been wearing. Then wrote and told him never to come back. And he's never been home in four years? Apparently not. But didn't Culpin ever wonder about that? She always had a reason, his ship rerouted and so on. But it seems Lewis replied, asking her to forgive him for what he had done. After that, he wrote to her fairly regularly, but never came back. His letters were some of the stuff she was burning earlier. But Lucy Calpin, that quiet, inoffensive woman, how could she have lived with it all these years? He was her only son. And about all she had left to live for, I'd imagine. Yes, he must have picked Diana up in the old man's car, and somewhere it happened. Where, I don't know. But he must have panicked when it all went wrong and then had to cover himself. She'd probably told him she'd just left Lundy. He knew where. Probably even saw him in Back Lane. Mm. So you think he brought the body back to Moat Bush, cleaned up any disturbance he made, leaving Lundy as a ready-made suspect? That's what I think. So you can go ahead for Lundy, Mr. Farr. You'll get all the back in your need. You've nothing to worry about now. Uh, except the right words to explain four years of lost freedom to Lundy. Do you think you'll get him? Seaman can be hard to trace, but we'll get him. Somewhere, sometime, we'll get him. And there's your receipt, Mr. Reed. Oh, thank you. Oh, I hope everything has been to your satisfaction. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't see Jenny in the dining room this morning. Uh, no, sir, she's not in. Oh? I'd, I'd hope to see her before I left. Oh, she just didn't show up this morning for some reason. Oh, I see. Well, thank her for me, will you? I will, yes. Oh, tell her... Uh, well, just tell her I asked. Uh, Mr. Reed? Mm. Oh, good morning, Mr. Oh, thank goodness. I, I was afraid I'd miss you. You're just in time. Oh, sorry, I'm late. Well, I didn't expect you to bother. Oh, but of course. I waited to find out about Mrs. Calpin. She's much easier this morning. Good. Apparently, she has a sister. Uh, she's going away to stay with her for a time. Now, that sounds best. You know, I think, just how grateful I am. How grateful Lundy will be. To Alison Bates, if to anyone. But I'll be interested to learn what happens. I'll let you know. And uh, what about the book? Slightly different ending now? <laughs> That's up to Jack Goodwin. Uh, but for yourself? For myself? Well, I think she's suffered enough. Don't you? Well, goodbye, Mr. Farr. And if ever I need a good lawyer, I'll know just where to come. <laughs>